Um, I'm here to talk about a tool called PG Rewind. Uh, first of all, my name is Heike Lindeganes. Uh, I currently work for Pivotal. Uh, I joined them in around May. Uh, before that, I worked for VMware for two years. Uh, PG Rewind is a tool I wrote while I, I was employed by VMware. Um, they needed, needed this tool for the replication stuff. Um, so I'm here to talk about PG Rewind. Uh, before we go on, uh, this is like the typical setup people have when, they're, when they want to have high availability. They set up one master system and one standby system, and they set up stream replication between the nodes. How many of you have a setup like this? With re replication, yeah, there we go, most people. Uh, it's very typical, uh, that's what people do. Uh, and of course you'll have something something in place so that you can fail over when your typical catastrophe happens and you, you know this is what we all prepare for it's the meteor strike that hits your master uh, and it completely destroys your master server and now all you have it left is the standby uh, but what's actually more common is that the master server doesn't actually die but there is some kind of a problem with it maybe you lose power for a while or maybe software glitch or maybe you have to update the operating system and reboot it or or the meteor hit the network and the master is actually still alive but you just didn't know about it. So the problem PG Rewind is, is designed to solve is the if you have already failed over to the standby server so the old standby is now the master server what you want to do when you find out that the master server didn't actually die is to set up the stream replication in the other direction and turn the old master into the new standby. And the question is, how do you do this? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we call while timelines. Uh, the while is the transaction log in process. It's the write ahead log. That's what the that's what the acronym stands for. Uh, so whenever in your system, whenever you do inserts or updates or any kind of operations, we always write a while record in the in the transaction log. Like here, you have insert one, insert two, and so forth. When you have when you have a master and a standby system, you will the standby will be following the timeline of the master. So every time you insert into the master, it gets copied over to the standby with a small delay. It's never going to be completely up to date. It's always asynchronous. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about synchronous replication later. Uh, but it, it's just a matter of life that whenever you insert something or modify something in the master, the standby will always lag a little bit behind. You can make the gap very small. You can, you can keep it up to date to milliseconds if, you're, if you have a good network and so forth. But it's always going to lag behind the master. So when you do failover, in Postgres we call that a promotion. And so what happens when you promote the standby to become the new master, in the standby server we create a new timeline which begins at the point where, where you did the failover or promotion. And what happens here is that there are some, some insertions or some updates on the first timeline that happened in the master server, in this case insert number two, but it was never copied over to the standby because there is this lag. So when the meteor strikes and you fail over, the second insert never made it to the standby server. Uh, but after you fail over, after you promote the standby, you will start to have new updates on the standby server. And at that point when you fail, uh, fail over, the standby will update what we call the timeline ID or TLI uh, to number two. It's just a sequential number that we bump every time you do a failover or promotion. And we also bump it if you do um, point in time recovery or anything that goes through the recovery process in Postgres really. So if you think about failing back, there is this situation where you have where you have these transactions. Right. Yeah, I mentioned that. So there's always going to be some transactions uh, on the master that were not copied to the standby. Uh, of course, if the system was completely idle, you might be lucky and there isn't anything because it is completely up to, state, up to date, but you always have to be prepared for the fact that there can be transactions that were not copied over. Um, so at this point, a lot of people say, hey, but that's what synchronous replication is for, so let's just use that. Uh, no, that doesn't actually help. There's always still going to be the possibility that you have a transaction that was already committed on the master 
but was not copied to the standby. And that's because synchronous replication is not magic. It, it, the standby will still lag behind the master, but with synchronous replication, it just means that the master will not acknowledge the commit to the user or the application until it has been flushed to disk in the standby. But there's still a delay. And another, another problem with synchronous replication is that it only makes the commits synchronous. Okay, so if you have if you begin a transaction and you do ten inserts, and then you commit, it will only do the like flushing and uh, syncing the standby at the commit time. But at that point, you've already inserted the rows to the table, and you've already updated the indexes and so forth. And if you just ignore all of that and you try to, um, it basically won't work. Uh, from a system point of view, the commits are not special. It's only it's only special to the application. But from the system point of view, you've already modified the disk, so you can't just uh, switch over. Uh, even if you try, even if you try to do a control failover, uh, that's possible. So you can do a control failover, and then you can be sure that there are no, no, nothing in that uh, red thing where you have transactions that were not copied over. If you do a control failover so that you stop all connections to the master and you make sure that it's completely idle and then you make sure that the standby is completely up to date, then you can possibly eliminate that problem. But it's actually pretty difficult to implement in practice because first of all, how do you, how do you verify that the standby got all the transactions? There is no built-in tool to check that. Um, you, could do, you could look at the there's a function, the current transaction uh, <coughs> xlog insertion point or something like that. You could look at that in the master and you could look at it at the standby and compare them, check that they're the same. But even then you have the problem that there can, might be a checkpoint that starts just at the moment you're about to shut down or auto vacuum kicks in and it starts to modify things again. So it's very difficult to make sure that the system is completely idle from, a, from a, this point of view. Uh, there is a system in place in Postgres so that when you shut down the master and stream replication is active, it will it will actually wait until the standby got all the all the while and it will only shut down after that. But again, you have to then verify that it, it only works as long as the stream replication is currently active and uh, connected. So if you rely on that, you will have to somehow verify that. The bottom line is that even doing a control failover where you just do a shutdown of the master and you wait and you try to make, make it clean. Even that is actually pretty tricky to do. So, so the problem here is how do, we, how do we get rid of these insertions or other updates that, that happened that were not copied over the standby that happened in the master? In this case, what we want to do is to erase that insert number two and uh, replace it with the stuff that happened in the, in the new master or the, or the standby after the failover. And the question is how to do that. Mm. Kind of your first thought might be that you just create the recovery.com file on the old master, you point it to the new master, and you let it do recovery. Uh, the problem is that this doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, you'll usually get an error like that. Uh, but even worse, I think there are cases where it might look like it works, but it will silently corrupt your database. So don't do that. Don't try to make, don't try to turn an old master system into a standby by just creating a recovery.com file. Hopefully you'll find out in testing that it doesn't work and you will give up. Because what will happen if you try to do that? It will try to recover like this. It will try to recover all the while that happened in the master and then will kind of skip over and try to recover the transaction log from the, uh, from the standby server, but it's not replaying that insert number three at all. And for example, if insert number two and insert number three happened on the same page on disk or it happened at the same location, maybe they updated the same indexes, it will just be a mismatch of both insertions and things will go wrong. But usually the system will stop you from doing that. It will give you an error. So the bottom line is that before 9.5 and PG Rewind, it's pretty difficult to, if you ever fail over, it's pretty difficult to do anything with the master, old master anymore. Uh, it's a very, it has been a very common question. People come, have asked me, like, 
okay, so now I fail over, how do I fail back? And uh, kind of the solution or answer we've been giving is that, yeah, you just have to throw away the old master and just create a new base backup and rebuild it from scratch. And people are like, what? That's crazy. <laughs> it's a perfectly good master server and it was just shut down for a while. Why do I have to rebuild it from scratch? And uh, that's, it's true, it is pretty crazy. Uh, but this works. Obviously, you can always just take a new back, base backup and set up the master from scratch. But it's obviously very slow because it means that you have to copy over all the data from the, from the standby server. Uh, it reads through all the data on the disk. It sends it through the network and it writes it all, all the disk on the master again. So it works. If you have a small database, I actually recommend doing this because it's very simple and it's very robust. You know what you get. You don't have to play with any other tools or anything. But as soon as you're talking about you know, tens of gigabytes, it tends to be slow. Um, kind of the second solution is basically the same as the first solution, where you just take a new base backup, but you can use rsync to, to speed it up. Uh, because rsync is a tool that uh, compares the, uh, the systems on both sides, and it will only send the difference. Which is very cool. I'm sure you're all familiar with asking for other things, but you can you can use it for this. Uh, one caveat is that you have to be very careful with the options you use because I think by default rsync relies on the timestamps of the files to determine if they changed, and uh, I don't think that's that's completely, uh, at least on some system, that you can't really rely on that because there might be some changes within the same millisecond or however granular your clocks are. Uh, so, but there is an option to make it safe. I don't remember what it is, and I, I, I didn't put it up on the slide because I, I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, but there is an option to force rsync to always use the checksum you know, to make sure that it recognizes all the all the changes. But it's still still pretty <coughs> slow because it still has to read all of the data on both systems so that it can compare them. It won't. It will only transfer the difference between oh, over the network, but it will still have to read everything. So it's still pretty pretty slow. So with 9.5, we have this tool called PG Rewind, and this is the solution to this problem. It works like rsync, but not quite. Uh, it only it only transfers the difference usually. And it will only read through and it will only copy that was changed because it uses the transaction lock to determine what has changed. So rsync reads through all of the data, calculates, calculates checksums, and it notices the difference that, differences that way. But PG Rewind will read through the transaction log to determine what has changed. Because the transaction log, that's what it's for. We record every change in the transaction log so we can use that. Um, I'm going to explain how PG Rewind works. By the way, if anyone has any questions at any point, just feel free to ask. Um, some terminology of PG Rewind. We call the new master, or what used to be the standby server that was promoted, we call that the source. And the old master that you want to turn into the standby, but that you fail over from, we call that the target. And the reason for these terms is that the source server, which is the standby server, and it's not the master server, uh, it's not modified at all. We're only reading from that. Just like with rsync, we would only be reading from that and copying over to the target. Um, and the target is the old master server. And what we're going to do with PG Rewind is that we're going to overwrite the data on the target server from the source. So. PG Rewind it goes through a couple of phases. First, it has to figure out what has changed in the old master that was not yet copied to the standby. So it will try to figure out what is that part in the where we have insert to in the target. It will try to scan the transaction log to figure out what is that portion. And then, after it's done that, it will copy over all of those blocks that were changed by the insertions or whatever updates there were it will try to copy them over from the, from the source to the target to overwrite them. So I like to describe PG Rewind that it's like rsync, uh, but it's supposed to a specific tool that uses the transaction log to be smarter than rsync. 
But from a user point of view, it, it's pretty similar to rsync. In what uh, the end result is the same as rsync. So when you start up PG Rewind, it will first try to find out where did the failover happen. Um, to do that, it will look at the PG control file. It's a it's a very important file in Postgres where we store the location of the last checkpoint and some other basic information about the about the cluster. It will look at the PG control file on both systems, and it will look at the last um, it will look at the last checkpoint location on on both both systems, and then it will scan the transaction log on the old master to figure out what was changed. And it will build a list of blocks that were changed on, on the old master that was not that, that were modified by any actions in the in the master so that it knows what it needs to copy. So after it has built this list, list of blocks that have changed, it will copy them over. Um, but that's that's not everything there is in, in Postgres. There's all kinds of files in the in the data directory that are not directly uh, transaction log. There's a configuration files, there's free space map files, there's visibility map files, there's the PGC log, sub transactions, there's all, all kinds of different files that are not directly transaction logged. And those files, it will just copy over uh, completely without trying to figure out what has changed. Because uh, it's kind of a safe approach in PG Rewind takes. Because um, if you go back, you remember that it's always safe to just rebuild the system from scratch. It's always safe to just copy the source to the target completely. And the reason we don't want to do that is because it's slow, but it's safe. So PG Rewind, whenever there's something it doesn't specifically know how to handle, it will always just copy it over because that's safe. Okay? So when you launch PG Rewind, it will build a list of files and it will, it will figure out what it needs to do to each of these files by comparing the source and the target. Um, you can actually get this output from the from the tool if you run it in the verbose mode. So in this case, you see that there's a few files it will just copy completely. And if you go further down, there's a copy tail means that the file was truncated um, in the source system. So it will need to copy the tail of that file that was truncated away back from the source system. And then there's some, some files that don't exist in the in the in the target, so it needs to uh, that don't exist in the source, so it will need to remove them from the target to, to make them the same. Um, so after it has done all of this copying, it will reset the, the layer, the, the control file on the old master to say, um, it will move the last checkpoint location to before the, the promotion. Because there might have been more checkpoints after the insert and so forth. But what we want to do after after you start up the system, we want we want to have the master to start the recovery from before the failover, and the normal while recovery will do the rest. It will um, replay all of the changes that had happened on the standby. Um, but at this point, we've already erased the insert number two from the system, so that is like that never happened. Um, so now we get into the consistent situation by just rewinding, uh, replaying all the log from the from the standby system. So that's how it works. Uh, <laughs> any questions at this point? Cool. Okay. Um, the bottom line is that PG Rewind it's like rsync, but it's specifically made for uh, Postgres for resynchronizing after a failover. That's the bottom line. And uh, I think the takeaway from all of this explanation is that it's pretty complicated in how it works, but it works by scanning the transaction log and comparing the source and the target. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to actually use this tool. If you, if you do pgvy-help, it will tell you this. Um, it needs a few options. There's a few mandatory options. You have to give it the location of the data directory that you're about to modify. And that's the old master. That's the target. That's the old master. So you have to specify that. And then you have to somehow point it to the source server. What do you want to synchronize it with? Uh, 
there are two ways to do that. You can either give it a location of the data directory if it's accessible from the same system. If they're both on the same file system, for example, or if you have uh, NFS or something set up so that you can access the file system. But what's probably more useful is that you can point it, you can give it a connection string and it will use uh, normal Postgres connection to connect to the source server and it will pull all the files through that connection over the network. So here's an example. In this case, uh, there's a, the old master's data directory is called data master. And I'm pointing PG Rewind to a server that's running on the same system, but on a different port, and I wanna synchronize it with that. Uh, it will give you, give you output like this. It'll, it will figure out where, where the systems, uh, where the failover happened, and then it will start to copy stuff. Um, but this is, this is the typical use case, the uh, way you run the tool. It's very simple. There's some nice options. For example, you can give, uh, get progress reports out of it, so it will tell you while it runs how much stuff it has left to copy and how much it needs to copy in total. In this case, you can see that it was a tiny, tiny data directory. It was only 67 megabytes, the whole, whole system, so we, <laughs> there wasn't much point in using PG Rewind in this case. I could have just copied it. But if it was tens of gigabytes, then it would be very nice if you only have to copy the difference. Um, if you run PG Rewind and nothing had actually changed, then then we it will. If, so if you manage to do the clean failover I talked about earlier, that is difficult to achieve in practice. But if you if you manage to do it and you run PG Rewind, it will just tell you that no rewind is required, uh, and it will do nothing, and everything is okay. Um, so it's always safe to run PG Rewind if you're not sure if you have to run it or not. You can just run it and see what happens. Um, there is also a dry run mode to PG Rewind. You can specify the dry run option. It means that it will do everything it would otherwise, but it will not actually modify the target server. So you can test it with that and see what would happen before you run it for real. Uh, it's very useful for testing. Some caveats. Um, for PG Rewind to work, you have to set an option in the config file called while log hints. Um, what this option will do, in Postgres there, there is these things we call hint bits on every table. And there are little flags we set on every row that indicates, okay, this transaction had committed or this transaction aborted on the row itself so that we don't have to consult the C log on, on every time you scan a table. Uh, but there is a problem for PG Rewind with that because those hint, setting those hint bits is not normally while logged. Um, so for PG Rewind to work, you have to set this little option. It will cause a little bit more uh, transaction log to be generated, uh, but it's not too bad. And it's actually the same thing. If you enable checksums, it will do the same thing for you. It will also have to create those extra while records. Uh, PG Rewind does the same thing, or the while log hints does the same thing. So if you're using checksums, if you had uh, enabled checksums when you uh, created your cluster, then you don't have to set that option. Um, if you don't set that option and you try to re run PG Rewind, it will, it will give you an error saying it won't work. Uh, so uh, in general, PG Rewind is pretty robust in the sense that it does a lot of checks before it starts to modify anything uh, to make sure that it knows what it's doing and not, it's not gonna just corrupt your database. So it's uh, usually pretty good at detecting strange situations it can't handle and it gives you an error message before modifying anything, which is good. That said, you should always take a backup before you, <laughs> you know, do anything drastic. Um, another a caveat with this is that for PG Rewind to work, you need to have all of the while, all of your transaction log from the old master. Uh, it has to be present in the PG log directory. So for example, if you go back, if you go back here, if in the master server you had, if, you, if it wasn't just a single insert or, or a few seconds of transactions that had happened on the master, if you had, if, if the, if the standby was lagging behind the master for like hours or days when, when you do the failover, 
which might happen if you have a network problem or something and you don't know this until a lot, a lot later. Um, what will happen is that the, build, the master server has already recycled or removed some of the transaction logs and it has probably sent them over to uh, you probably, hopefully you have a while archiving set up so it has already archived them. Uh, in that case, PG Rewind will not work because it doesn't know to look into the while archive to find the while files. It will expect them all to be in PGX log directory. Uh, there's an easy workaround for that. You can just take them from the while archive and copy them into the PGX log directory and then PG Rewind will find them. Um, but it's a little thing you we might want to address later and maybe add some support for while archiving here. Um, there are some more use cases that you could use this for. So this presentation is based on the idea that you do failover and then you want to do failback. Okay, but you might want to do it the other way around as well. What if you had done failover and then you do some stuff on the new master, but you don't actually, for some reason, maybe you screwed up something at the failover and you, you want to throw away the new master and uh, kind of reset the old master. So it would be nice to do it the other way around and be able to resynchronize the standby to the old master and erase everything that happened in the standby instead. Um, PG Rewind doesn't currently handle that. It, it has some assumptions when it starts to scan the transaction logs that they are in the like certain order. Uh, but it would, in principle, it should be possible to lift those limitations and make it better if someone has the time and submit the patch for that. Um, but it's maybe something we'll do in the future. But there's some other, other nice use cases you could do. You could use PG Rewind to rewind back to an earlier base backup, for example, instead of having to restore the whole base backup. Uh, so there are all, con all kinds of nice use cases you could use this, uh, but it probably won't work for all of them. I haven't tested them. It will probably give you an error about the timelines not being the way it expects. So some central design goals for PG Rewind has been safety. As I said earlier, it will try very hard to do all kinds of sanity checks and it will read the while, it will construct a list of files to modify before it actually starts to modify anything. So I tried to make it as safe as possible so that it will give you a nice error message if something is wrong or it's not going to work. And I mentioned the dry run mode, it's very useful. And another important safety feature is, is that if there's any, any files in the data directory it doesn't recognize, it will just copy them over completely. Because again, as I said earlier, that's always safe. It's always safe to just copy the data directory completely. Um, there has, has been some discussion uh, and some surprise over the fact that it copies all the configuration files and everything completely. Just like rsync does and just like the normal copy command does, it will copy over everything. Uh, but it's it might be useful to not, for example, overwrite your configuration files. Uh, very often you don't want to copy over the configuration files because you might have a different configuration on the master and the standby. Um, so if there are any files like that that you want to keep before you run PG Rewind, you have to copy them somewhere else and then copy them back after running PG Rewind. Um, maybe we'll add some options for that later. Maybe, I don't know. Another thing, if you have, if you have your logs, like the debugging logs in the data directory. It will also copy those. <laughs> so if you plan to use PG Rewind, you might want to not keep your logs in the data directory. Uh, it will work, and it, but it's a bit silly to copy them over because if, there, if you have gigabytes of logs, it will slow you down. I tried to make it as easy as, used to pos as possible. Uh, there's only a few mandatory options, the source and the target, and then you just launch it. And of course, it has to be faster than just doing rsync because otherwise there's no point in, in having the tool in the first place. Uh, currently, I haven't heard anyone complain about the speed or anything, but it's possible that if you, if you, have, if you only have very, very little changes that it needs to rewind, it will still have to copy all the free space maps and visibility maps, which can be like hundreds of megabytes if you have a large database. So it still has to copy quite a lot but if you have a large enough database, hopefully it's still a lot less than copying the whole data, all of the data. Um, we could make it smarter in the future. For example, we could try to do what rsync does for the files that we don't recognize 
and calculate the checksums and only copy over the diff. Uh, but that's something to do in the future. So the current status is that PG Rewind is available in Postgres 9.5. Ooh, it went in. Very nice. Uh, there were some big changes I had to do in, in Postgres 9.5 to support PG Rewind. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the while record format. Uh, I changed the while record format in 9.5 quite, quite drastically. Um, because before 9.5 there were no information, or there were, the information on what block a certain while record modified, it was not stored in a common format. It was different for an index split uh, record, it was different for an index insert, it was different from a heap insert for a heap update. So when in PG Rewind needs to know what the blocks a certain record modified, uh, I had to, before, before these while record changes, the, you basically had to understand every different while record type that there is in Postgres. And that was a bit painful. It was a very long, long switch case statement in the code to, to figure out what kind of a while record is this and what does the, how do I figure out what blocks this changed. Uh, and it was very error prone as well. Whenever you added or modified one of the water records type in Postgres, you always have to keep it up to date. So in 9.5, I modified the while record format so that there is now like a common header in every while record, which indicates, okay, this record modifies block number one, two, three, or block number this and that. And uh, it's the same, for, it's very now very easy to figure out what, what's what it changes, even without understanding what kind of a record it is. And there's all kinds of tools that can actually benefit from this. Uh, years ago, there was uh, some Japanese guys wrote a tool called PG Read Ahead, or well, I forget what it was called, something like that, Read Ahead something, uh, which was a tool that reads your transaction log and it figures out what blocks it changes. Again, it's the same, same problem they had. And then it will do read ahead of those blocks from disk. And the idea of that is that it, it will speed up recovery a lot. So they kind of had the same problem and hopefully this new raw record format will make that tool a lot easier to write to. And I'm sure there are a lot of similar stuff that you can now do. The new wild record format is also a little, little bit smaller. I managed to squeeze out some padding from it and so forth. So you can probably get like 5% less transaction log in 9.5, uh, which is nice. I mean, people often complain that the Postgres writes a lot of transaction log, so it's very nice to be able to compress that a little bit. Uh, I should also mention there are some other changes in 9.5. Uh, we changed the CRC, the checksum algorithm on while. Uh, that's invisible to a user other than it makes it a little bit faster because the new algorithm is faster to calculate. So that was nice. Um, so PG Rewind, it's available in line, it's included in 9.5, but there is also a standalone version uh, for 9.3 and 9.4 if you're interested. I originally started working on this tool around that time as a external tool for 9.3 and 9.4. Uh, but I, I mean, the goal was from the beginning that it will get included in the Postgres proper, but it was easier to start developing it outside. Uh, but it's still out there. If, you, if you're interested, you can download that tool for 9.3 and 9.4. Uh, there's a guy called Michael Pakir, Michel Pakir, actually, yeah, it's a French name. I, <laughs> Michel, yeah, there we go, <laughs> Michel Pakir. Uh, he lives in Japan nowadays, but he works for VMware, and we work a lot on VMware, uh, PG Rewind together. Uh, but he's still maintaining this for 9.3 and 9.4, I think. I haven't really been following, but I think he has kept up to date. That said, I, I mean, if, you're, if you really need this tool, what I really recommend is to upgrade to 9.5 because it's, I mean, it's a good thing to upgrade anyway. You'll have to do it even, eventually anyway, so it's better to be up to date. So, so, so there's all the future development we can do. Uh, I mentioned we could be smarter about what to copy, the free space map, visibility maps, and so forth. Um, could use checksums to skip unchanged parts. Uh, there was just a guy, I think it was Alexander Korotko on the mailing list, just posted a couple of weeks ago a patch uh, to make PG Rewind more useful for some of these, these cases. Uh, so hopefully some of these, these other use cases will be addressed in, uh, in 9.6 if, 
if the, those patches pan out and get, get committed, which is very nice. Um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you to Michelle back here and uh, everyone else. There has been other people submitting patches and, and bug reports. Uh, Fuji Masao from uh, NTT that was very active and others. And thank you for inviting me here in Paris. It was very nice to be here. Any questions? Yes? So how do I detect uh, this one? Right. Uh, so both of the systems, so how do I detect the point where the failover happened? That's the question. Right. Um, how do I detect that? <laughs> uh, right. So I think we don't have to detect the failover point exactly. It's enough that we, I think what PGV1 actually does, it, it finds the last checkpoint uh, before the point where, where the failover happened. And the way to detect that is to, um, <coughs> see how does it work? Uh, my question yeah. is, Uh, I would recommend um, you can run it, and if, it, if PG Rewind will check if there was actually any loss to transactions or any anything, uh, any difference, and the PG Rewind will detect that for you, and it will just exit quickly if there was nothing to do. Um, it was, uh, I think I mentioned it here. Yeah, it's, it's this clean over failover uh, case. So if there was nothing to do, it will. I mean, this will happen quickly. It will take a few seconds, and it will tell you uh, I didn't have to do anything. Any more questions? Yes? Yes, uh, when you run PG Rewind, it, you will lose insert number two. So yeah, that's actually a good point. Uh, when you run PG Rewind, you will lose all the stuff that had happened in the master uh, that were not copied over to the standby yet. If you copied over the data directory completely or started in your base back, you also lose that. But, you, but it's a good point. You actually might, before you run this tool or before you restore from a backup or anything, you probably want to, or you might want to take a base backup or a backup of the old master, or maybe use a file system snapshot or something to keep that situation. Because um, if there was anything important there, you might want to go back and somehow figure out how it you know, I mean, there's no automated way to keep both changes, both insert two and all the changes from the uh, from the new master, because they might be conflicting. You might be inserting to the same location on disk, uh, or even at, at the logical sense, you might be update. You might have updated the same row in, in <laughs> uh, both systems, but it's a different update. So there, there is no automated way to solve that problem. It's kind of the same problem you have with the logical replication that's asynchronous. You have to somehow figure out how to, um, if there's a conflict, how do you resolve the conflict? So PG Rewind doesn't even try. Yes. Uh, yeah, that should be safe. Of course, you have to make some space to, to make it work. Uh, because otherwise you'll just hit the disk full error again. But yeah, disk full shouldn't be any different from, from other kind of errors. In general, if, if Postgres, in Postgres in general, if you run out of disk space, it will usually just give you a nice error message, I ran out of disk space, and it will continue to run. Uh, but there's an exception to that. If you run out of disk space while the system was trying to write the transaction log or expand the transaction log, then it will panic and it will shut down. Uh, which is something that would be nice to fix, but there it is. Hmm? Yeah, so if you're confident about what's in the mas old master? Or, um, 
I'm not sure I understood the question. If you if you know so if you know that there is no insert to like in, like in this case that you care about, then is that what you're saying? Then you could just don't need to care about that. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Is it working with wall shipping replication? With wall shipping replication? Yes, it does work with wall shipping replication. Um, yeah, I just use streaming replication as an example. That's the typical case. It also works with file shipping. Or in file shipping, there is no difference except that you will usually have a longer delay and you will usually have more of these lost transactions or lost updates. But I mean, you already accepted that when you're using file shipping. So yeah, BTP one will work. It doesn't care. Any more questions? Well, so my recommendation is, if you can just rebuild from scratch, then by all means do that. If it's a small enough database that you can comfortably just recreate it, then I mean that's always safe. That's that's very safe. <laughs> that obviously works. Uh, so just do that. The problem is that you, you usually you don't want to wait for three hours to take the base back up and so forth, and that's what PG Rewind is for. So if you can take a base backup, do it, but usually with a reasonable size database, you can't. Yes? Right, yeah, that's a good question also. So no, PG Rewind will not tell you about, I mean, what was lost or that there was something. Uh, that's actually a that would be a very nice feature. I've been thinking that we should add that because PG Rewind already scans the transaction log, so it kind of already sees all of that transaction, so it, it should know, it, it does know what happened there, uh, but the, it doesn't output it to the user currently. Uh, the transaction log is pretty low level stuff. It will, it will contain things like insert this record into a, this page on disk, so you can easily get like good details, you like you can't get the insert statement out of it, uh, but you could definitely at least get the count of how many transactions, how many commits you lost. Uh, that would be already very useful because if you didn't lose any commits, then from a user point of view, you lost nothing, even if there were some index updates or auto vacuum or something like that. So that's actually that that would be a very nice feature. We should definitely do that. Uh, there is a tool in uh, in Postgres the for scanning the transaction log in general, uh, the PG, what's it called, Xlog dump. So you could run that and look at the output and try to figure out if there are some commits, commits there, but it's, uh, it's not a very user-friendly tool. It's a developer tool, mostly. Okay. Um, anyway, we have more time. Sure.